Africa, we have um, four species of primates, actually five species of primates. Um, we've got the uh, macaque, the brillo. We've got the uh, gray langur, or the wanderu. We've got the uh, purple-faced langur, which is the kalu wanderu, or the, uh, which is also sometimes known as the, uh, the bear monkey. Uh, and then you have, you've got the small uh, dot which you don't see very often. Um, <clears throat> of those four species, uh, they, they're found in most parts of the island, uh, but they are adapted to the different Plato zoo uh, climatic zones of Sri Lanka. As you know, most of Sri Lanka is divided. Oh, here we go. Thank you.
try to categorize them as to how uh, threatened they are, how, how threatened their future is as a species. And if you look at these animals from a species level, then yes, we've got plenty of wanderers, uh, we've got plenty of macaques. But if you look at where you're supposed to look, and that is at the subspecies level, then some of these subspecies are actually threatening them. The gray langer, the uh, which is found in most of the dry zone that we found here. And the choke macaque again in three different subspecies, the dry zone, the wet zone, and the crystallinas up in the, uh, the hill zone. And if you look at these, some of these differences, again, like I said, these are not just minor differences between subspecies. This is the dry zone fellow. Uh, he's got a very small head, uh, throat, what you call it, a uh, bonnet on the head. And this is the wet, this is the uh, pistolinas you find, uh, probably you find up in uh, in Urelia and in the Wharton Plain, and in the Wharton Plain, the all the Wharton Plain. Quite, quite different. He has yellow fur, he's got that dark brown fur. So there's a major difference. Here again, for the macaque, are some of the morphological differences between the three subspecies that we find. These are the ones in the dry zone, MS Simica, so light brown fur, short toes. These are the ones found in around, what else? Candy in the wet zone, um, around uh, uh, Kagon, other places in the uh, wet zone. Very so copper color pelage, uh, and the coat structure tends to be more like the dry zone. The highland, highland subspecies, the Opistomilas, dark brown fur, very heavy fur, it's cold up there, so they have heavy fur. And they have these long over, they have these long, uh, what we call coat hair, bonnet hairs. So very distinct uh, uh, differences amongst these subspecies. So when you talk about conservation of primates in Sri Lanka or anywhere, then uh, zoologists or primatologists, like primatologists or people who study primates, then we really try to emphasize don't look at the species, we need to look at the subspecies, uh, because that's where some of the major differences are. And if you look at the macaque, if you look at the dope macaque as a whole on the island, is it threatened? No, it's not really threatened. There are plenty of uh, uh, monkeys around uh, Kandy and Polaru and Ranapura. But um, if you look at the subspecies differences, then some of these fellows are threatened. I mean, there's so much conversion of habitat in the Norelia district, converting forest into uh, vegetable plots. But these fellows have no place left to live. Also, people poison them. They're not protected. So it's not, it's altogether not, not a good scene. And you know, Sri Lanka prides itself on biodiversity. This is supposed to be a hot spot in bio, a global hot spot in biodiversity. And it is up to this country, the authorities, to protect that biodiversity. You know, this is your, supposed to be your reputation. This is your biological heritage by the diversity of animal life on Sri Lanka. By totally ignoring this, the diversity and saying, oh, oh we have an Aprila, oh, come on, man. And say, these fellows, if these fellows are kill, killed off, no problem, because we have these fellows over here. That is not how to do things. That is not conserving biodiversity. That is politics. It is not, it is not biology and it's not conservation. So what I'm saying is that some of these subspecies, like the Opistomilas, and some others, some, uh, some of the uh, purple faced langurs, the ones around uh, Colombo, they have no place left to live. They live in gardens, and these gardens are temporary. You know, these are no, they're really, there's no real um, program uh, or policy to try to uh, preserve these, uh, these species, these subspecies. Um, how are we doing? Um, what I'd like to do now is, um, well, all right, we can just go on here a little bit. Um, each of these uh, different species of primates, they are sort of adapted to do a certain to a certain lifestyle. Um, these are here we have the gray langurs and the purple face, the gray langurs and the macaques. I'm sorry, interacting in both the four of them. The slender lores. We want to look at the niche of the slender loris. The niche is the kinds of uh, qualities, what an animal's physiology and anatomy 
is and what its behavior is to make a living, then the uh, dolores, the nocturnal, you know, at night, they are active at nighttime, they're slow, arboreal climbers, you can't run around at nighttime without falling off the trees. Uh, they've got large eyes and ears so that they can see well at nighttime. They've got small plastic hands for good grasp of branches, sharp cutting teeth, simple guts, um, and they have special scent glands on which they mark their environment. Um, their diets of insects uh, and lizards and so forth. They can be these these uh, lorises, they are they represent a a very early form of primate that hasn't changed much through the last 60 million years or so. And in those days, most mammals, um, well, if you look at the history of mammals, they started off during the age of dinosaurs, when the dinosaurs really reigned the daytime uh, landscape. And mammals in those days were nocturnal, nighttime mammals. So if you're going to be living at nighttime only, you need to have a good, if you want to navigate, you need a good sense of smell. So the retention of a good sense of smell uh, is we consider it a, an evolutionary ancient, or another word for it, but which I don't like, is primitive, uh, primitive trait. And in the higher mammals, the sense of smell has, uh, has, has been reduced, and the sense of vision has expanded at the expense of sense of smell. But these little, these small uh, lorises, let me show you a picture of them, here we go. Uh, these small lorises, they have special scent glands on their wrists and on the, around their anus by which they mark their environment. The, the odor that they lay down on the trees tells other monkeys what sex they are, what age they are, what reproductive condition they're in. Probably tells the neighbors something about individual identity, who they are. That's a way. It's a way that they communicate uh, with uh, other lorises in, in the environment. And they have small territory. Each each loris has its own little territory, little piece of land where it lives. But it's usually the mother and its young who are who are in the territory, and the males will come, they also develop several uh, lorus territories. The purple-faced langer, let's look at this fellow, he's a, a typical leaf-eating primate. Now, we've got two kinds of primates that I've, in, in Sri Lanka. We've got the, uh, the langors, which are leaf-eaters. There are two species, the purple-faced and the gray, and we've got the macaque. Now, the langors are leaf-eaters, which means that they have a specialized gut able to handle leaves. The problem with eating leaves is that most of the leaves are cellulose and you can't digest the stuff. It's not nutritious. Also, uh, trees don't like to have their leaves eaten, so they uh, develop uh, spines and other defense mechanisms by which to, 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 to um, discourage animals from eating. And one of the defense mechanisms is chemical. So if a monkey eats a leaf, it uh, has a consumes alkaloids, which could potentially make it sick and even potentially kill it. So how do these leaf-eating monkeys survive given these handy, given these challenges? Well, um, they have a stomach that's sort of by the foregut and the hindgut. And in the foregut, they have uh, bacteria, commensal bacteria. And um, in the absence of these bacteria, the malangers wouldn't be able to live. So the, langers, the, the bacteria in the langers foregut has two functions. First, it breaks down the cellulose, which is normally digestible, it breaks the cellulose into simpler compounds, carbohydrates and sugars, that the animals can digest. So that's one big advantage. The second thing it does is uh, neutralizes some of these poisons uh, that the, uh, the plants imbue themselves with as a defense mechanism. So uh, having these bacteria in the gut is basically a, a their way of surviving and making a living. Now the macaque doesn't have this sort of advantage. They don't have these kind of bacteria. They can eat leaves. Yes, they can eat you know, young leaves uh, that are, uh, they don't have, they haven't developed any alkaloids yet, just like you and I can eat uh, some leaves, lettuce, and so forth. Um, but basically, they're in, they are fruit givers. They're, they're fruit eaters. Now, if you look at the, if you, look, if you go into any forest, then there are lots more leaves than there are uh, than there are than there are fruit, and the number of monkeys that are found in any one jungle or in any one area is really very much dependent upon how much food there is available for them. So, 
Uh, in the forest, there are many more leaves than there are fruit and flowers. So what does that mean? That, what would you expect? Do you expect there to be more langurs or more macaques? Anybody? <laughs> Forest. We've got two kinds of monkeys. One eats leaves, the other one eats fruit. There are more the numbers of monkeys that you see in a habitat is dependent upon the amount of food that there is. For the land for the langurs, there are many more leaves than there are fruit for the macaques. So which one would you expect to be more numerous in the forest? Old level graduates for the cream of the crop. Come on, someone, someone, someone. You. Yes, languors. Why are you so wise or shy? They're all, yes, there's more, there are more leaves, so you, you have to say you have more languors. Um, um, it also means that if you look at the uh, ecological relationships between these uh, species, um, the langur, although they can eat leaves, they also like to eat fruit. So here we have a situation where a macaque can only eat fruit, but a langur can eat fruit and leaves. So if there's a contest for any, any, any food item, and there's lots of contests, these monkeys are always competing for food items, um, we have a situation where the langur could actually eat the macaque out of house and home. He has the, uh, there, are many, there are more of them, leaves and they can eat fruit. So how, can, how is it that the macaque can survive? The other interesting thing to keep in mind now, the macaque is only about this big, whereas the langur is, is this much bigger, about five times the size of a, macaque, of a macaque. Now, the only way that a macaque can really survive in the company of a langur is for him to be, be behaviorally very aggressive. And that's why, that that's why in fact, macaques tend to be very exploratory, very aggressive very aggressive, aggressive amongst themselves. So even a small macaque can supplant a big, a big langur. The relationship is sort of like boys and cows. You know, boy, human boys, they can chase a cow up any time. It's the same with the macaques, macaques and langurs. A small macaque can chase off a langur. And if that didn't happen, if I mean, this, this sort of behavioral, ecological relationship exists because uh, it's a survival strategy for the macaque. Any macaque ancestor, any great-great-grandfather macaque who was not able to supplant a langur wouldn't have probably died and not left any offspring. So the behavior, the genetically determined behavioral trait of being aggressive towards other monkeys in the forest um, uh, was, was honed by this uh, need for superiority in competition for food resources. Does that make sense? Does that make any sense? I go, man. Don't look like I'm like I'm in the cemetery here. Come on. Does it make any sense to you? Is it true? Does it make it then I want? Hurry, that's what I want. Right. So we sort of discussed the uh, differences in these uh, all right, if you here's another important thing for you to consider because uh, you all biology students. If you look, the number of monkeys in a forest is really dependent, I have said this already, dependent upon the amount of food there is available. Now what, I, what we have here is a chart of the number of monkeys, population size, uh, over many different years. And what you find is that the number of monkeys during the birth season increases, or they decrease it again, die off during the dry season. Birth season, really up, dry season, die off, up and down, up and down. So it is across many years, and if you draw a straight line through this, then you find zero population growth. In a, in a natural, undisturbed environment, uh, monkeys are under zero population growth regime, which really means that on average, each monkey only replaces itself by one of its sons or daughters. A female can have up to 10 infants in her lifetime, but on average, only one of them will survive to replace two or in the forest. That's what zero population growth translates into. Now, that puts macaques, puts monkeys in a very peculiar situation because like any other life form, macaques have evolved through time to survive and to reproduce maximally. 
macaques are just another, just another, just like a piece of, just like grass or a, or like a bacterium or like a cow or like a wolf or like a human being. Their purpose on life, from a biological point of view, is there's only one purpose, and that is to pass the genes in its body on to the next generation. Its body is a temporary carrier. It's an epiphenomenon. We all think highly of ourselves, but basically we're here only for one purpose, and that is to pass our genes on to the next generation. And what survives from generation to generation is not us, we as individuals, but the genes that we have in our, in our bodies. And by mating with others, by, by mating, by, by having a sexual mating system, the, the genes get mixed up and you get better combinations of genes, better qualities that are passed on from generation to generation. But the point is that, um, like all life forms, the main purpose of anything that you see in the, in, the, in the living world, its main purpose has been, through eons of time, to reproduce the DNA its, uh, itself. It's not for the it's not for the preservation of the species, not for the preservation of <clears throat> preservation of the individual even. But what gets basically what you have here are these DNA molecules manipulating organisms, in, manipulating individuals, including us, into doing things that perpetuates that DNA molecule. Now the DNA molecule doesn't have any head, it doesn't doesn't think. It's just one of these things. That's that's how this how things happen. To so we are basically your temporary carriers. No matter how much we like to think of ourselves as brilliant doctors or engineers, we're here for a very short time, and what we pass on is a portion of our DNA. Right. So, um, and what which DNA gets passed on is dependent upon how successful the bodies are in competing against other bodies in, in passing on that gene. So, for example, if you are very, if you are very, if you are a very aggressive monkey, um, and uh, by being aggressive, others gang up on you and kill you, uh, your DNA has no chance of uh, of, uh, of being perpetuated in the next uh, generation. In other words, the DNA that encodes that kind of aggressive behavior is selected against because it's not, it doesn't. That behavioral trait does not contribute to carrying that, uh, uh, promoting that DNA into future generations. And so it is with many different behavioral traits. I mean, mothers are nice to us um, because uh, it, it, uh, it's good for their reproductive success. By being nice, they are being kind to their children, fathers as well. Uh, they are doing something for their for their children so that they survive. In other words, they are the carriers of their genes that will let me carry let me carry forward. So there are many behaviors that we have. <coughs> well, all behaviors that we have can be interpreted uh, from this sort of uh, uh, DNA manipulation kind of uh, uh, paradigm. Now I'm really going to straight here. But what what we're saying here with this? All right. So what we're saying with this? Zero population growth is that on the average only one individual, <clears throat> either the animals are designed to reproduce maximally, but they can't because there's a lot of competition. Everybody, every, every organism out there, every monkey, every dog, every rat, every bird, every human wants to reproduce maximally, but it can't because there, because there are economic and ecological constraints, uh, social constraints. Uh, in a monkey society, for example, there's a strict hierarchy, and only the highest ranking female will really be able to reproduce, uh, will be able to, to reproduce more than others. Let's go in. Within a monkey society, there's a hierarchy. The highest ranking, first ranking, second ranking, third, fourth, and so forth. The highest ranking female can take food from all the others. The second ranking female can take food from the third, fourth ranking, but not from the first. And what this translates is reproductive success and survival and survivorship. So, the highest ranking female, she may have two or three daughters, and if they if they all survive, then under this regime here, zero population growth, uh, it means that three other females don't have any daughters that survive. They may give birth to five or six daughters in their lifetime, but none of them will survive simply because the highest ranking female uh, takes charge, takes over. She. By, by way of her behavior, she, she assures that if three of her daughters are, um, are, are uh, surviving for the next generation. So there are many of these kinds of behaviors that we 
look at from this from this point of, from this point of view. So not just maternal behavior; it's also maternal behavior, uh, forming alliances between uh, between kin and non kin, and so forth. And I won't get into all that because uh, we don't have the time for it. All right, here's just another slide that's relevant to all of you. Um, and I, was, I just talked about zero population growth. And I said that the number of monkeys found in any one habitat, any one area, is dependent on the number of amount of food that's available. Now, at Fort Lauderdale, over 30 years, we had three groups with overlap, near, basically overlapping homes, right? They lived in the same area. One of those groups, when tourism started to flourish, local tourism especially started to flourish in, in Fort Lauderdale, lots of garbage around. And one group really took advantage of that garbage. And the, the group that had access to garbage grew. Look at this, the red line. This is the number of monkeys, group size, the number of monkeys, over about 20, over a 30 year period. Look how, how much they grew. And if you go up to, to the present, they're, they're somewhere up here. Uh, two neighboring groups, uh, they had minimal access. 5% garbage, they're about like this, slight growth. And two, less than 2% garbage in their diet, they remain approximately the same zero population growth, which, which is the norm for an undisturbed uh, um, primate group or primate population of a species in its natural environment. So one of the reasons that you have so many monkeys hanging around Kandy, Polonorua, uh, Anuradhapura, and other places is because people feed them. They have this garbage around. You go to Mali Garden. You know, they're, they're, the monkeys are all over the place. They're all over the place because <clears throat> there are rice packets given to them. Um, the monkeys in Uruatakere, they don't even stay inside the jungle anymore. A monkey in Porongrua, in a natural forest environment, they get up at six. They get up at 5.30 in the morning, they're hungry, and they go to the forest, and they will eat insects, they'll find small grass seeds, they'll eat whatever fruit, whatever they can find. It takes a lot of work to make a living. These fellows in Uruatakara, they get up at 9 o'clock in the morning because they know by 10 o'clock, the uh, candy nursing home, the cooks, they throw all their, all their garbage from the cooking, they throw that out the back and the monkeys have access to them. So they are lazy, they're, they're, so they, they're fat, and they're overpopulated. There are many, many of them. There is this constraint of food limitation has been removed through human feeding. And so it is not just at the candy nursing home, so it is in many other places. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka, which is why we have pest monkeys now. If you go driving around and say, oh God, we have so many monkeys. You don't have that many monkeys. Yes, you have a few more monkeys uh, because they come with the garbage. But what happens is you go into the jungle area and there aren't any monkeys there. Why? Because uh, why, does it, why should they work eight, nine hours a day to get a mouthful when they can go just one kilometer, hang around the town, and wait for a rice pack? That's easy, you know? It's like you know, like, like us going to the KFC or wherever it is that you want to go to get a palace and getting and getting and getting a free lunch. That's what the monkeys do. So overpopulation of monkeys is a human thing. You, it's a human thing. It's caused by by, by human behavior. Anyhow, I won't. And if you if you're a subscriber to the Loris magazine, there's an article in this December issue of Loris magazine uh, uh, sort of addressing this kind of problem. Okay, what I'm going to do now is to uh, uh, stop my talking, and I'm going to show you a film, or a portion of a 